Oh, hey, it, we didn't, no we didn't talk like about home. who was going to talk first. This is a uh, look at this. <laughs> it's almost like we haven't done this for two weeks. I know we're rusty. <laughs> we're rusty. <laughs> We're rusty, and and while we're both rusty, I'm welcome to BC Poly Hot Stove. I'm McLean K. I'm the editor in chief of the Orca, joining you live with my Mickey Mouse earphones in my living room, uh, and I'm joined in a socially distant manner yes. by, yes, protected by the Salish Sea from McLean. Actually, uh, he's protected from me since uh, there are no cases on Vancouver Island anymore. But sure. it's Jordan Bateman, Vice President of Communications for the Independent Contractors and Businesses Association, and McLean. I'm glad to be back with you. Um, that George, he just talked too much for me. I didn't get any chance to rant. Um, you then got painted as kind of like an expert on Unspun, which I cannot abide in any way. So we're back into our familiar roles. Yes, back to there's no place like home. We, we clicked heels on our Magic Ruby slippers and we're back where we belong. And tomorrow, if you're waiting uh, to see George and Jody back together, uh, they'll be taping Unspun uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. They're like the more reasonable version of us. Yes, the more reasonable sort of upper echelon. <laughs> <laughs> the creme de la creme of That's us, right. if you would prefer. The, uh, uh, we're, we're more the, uh, the flyover states, the, uh, <laughs> the heartlands, uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, no, I'm just kidding. They, uh, they do great work, obviously. And it was nice to talk yes, to George do. last week. I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed talking to him because uh, uh, we talk a little bit offline on some stuff that uh, ICBA does. But... Uh, you know, he's a smart guy, and and look, there's no one better tuned into Vancouver politics than him. And you know, this may shock you to hear this, but I also enjoyed uh, doing a show with Jody last week. <laughs> yes, well, yeah, she, I mean, the it's, consummate pro. It's Jody Vance. Like, <laughs> like, you know, she had a. She, she's just so good at the segues. She just kind of moves you along. And you don't even realize it, and you've been swept out by the tide, and it's all over. It's great. And it goes by very fast. Yeah. Yep. Um, McLean, can we talk about money laundering? I yeah, I feel like we should. Okay, so uh, the Money Laundering uh, Commission has uh, begun their work. This is the um, public inquiry that uh, the unions and you know, Mayor McDreamy demanded, um, that John Horgan uh, seemed a little reluctant on, and that Dave Eby pretended to be reluctant on, but you know, was more than happy to finally uh, initialize, because you know, the, the long-term plan for the NDP is to remind people that you know, money laundering only happens under BC Liberal watch. And you know they're corrupt and should be you know held away from office forever. That's kind of the uh, the political unspun part of it, if you will. Um, but finally, we have some experts starting to testify. Uh, mm -hmm. Yesterday was uh, or a couple of days ago was the first um, uh, first time it's being done on Zoom. The media love it because they can sit at home in their uh, in their pajama bottoms and watch it and report. And the first expert was pretty underwhelming and Ian Mulgrew uh, the great uh, court reporter for the uh, Vancouver Sun and, and let me tell you there's no one better writing about courts justice those issues than Ian Mulgrew uh, he knows uh, he, he knows this stuff backwards and forwards uh, he wrote a piece basically kind of eviscerating this first expert and uh, I would say you know day one uh, did not go the uh, the way the NDP had hoped I, I mean I will be totally honest. I only I didn't watch the the commission at home. Uh, oh God, no one will. Well, well uh, also because I have a five year old running around, and uh, you know, an entire day on Zoom is it's just not going to happen. But um, I read Melgrew's piece, and yeah, he said it was kind of you know a, a rehash of the stuff we've seen before, and that he, I think he said like hopefully the experts will come with more than you know the same news clippings. That's again, that's one person's opinion of it. I mm -hmm. haven't seen it, but uh, it it didn't seem like a very overwhelming beginning. Look, and beyond Mulgrew, there was coverage in CBC and Global and other places. Yep. No one reported anything new out of that. No. And, in fact, he, the, he, was kind of criti he was criticized and held to account by other lawyers. You know, you seem just to be rehashing media accounts. At, you know, there's no academic research. He's like, well, there's very little academic research on this. You know, he went into a little bit about what's happened in other jurisdictions, but mainly in the pre-Bitcoin era and, you know, examples from, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And he admitted that he had not been keeping totally up to date on the file in the past 10 years. Um, certainly did not have anything to lend us as far as what was going on in, in BC, nothing we didn't know already. And we come back to McLean, like we've talked about this before, where, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, Kathy Tomlinson, The Globe, Sam Cooper, Global slash uh, The Province did some great work on this. But we're in a cycle where we're just rehashing their stories over and over again. There's nothing new there. And I keep coming back to the fact that like, if there were more, 
if there were hockey bags of cash going into casinos on a regular occasion, we would have seen more than one video of it. There would have been dozens of videos of it, right? Like we would have seen this over and over again. And you begin to wonder, you know, were the, you know, was John Horgan's gut right? And is this a bit of an overreach? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess we're going to find out. I, I, I tend to sort of agree with you. I think it was for the problem to be as widespread as has been alleged, you, I like you, think that we would have seen more hints of it. But I guess we'll see. I think you're right. I mean, a thing like a casino and a hockey bag full of money that feels like it's the kind of thing that you'd get, that would get noticed more. I mean, there, there is no more videotaped uh, <laughs> area on the planet than a casino floor. Yep. But again, we shall see. Yeah. So Mulgrew's point was, look, a, a little bit like, this happens in every Western country. Yeah. Um, it's happened since the beginning of time, even in BC. Um, you know, so what is the new thing? And, you know, the, the expert finally concludes with, well, you know, it's always going to happen. They're smarter than we are. You'll devise a new system and they'll get around it anyways. It's, uh, you know, what organized crime does. Um, yeah, no, no, not a heartening start to the uh, inquiry hawks out there, that's for sure. And you're right. I mean, I, I think it's clear politically that what the, uh, you know, David E.B. and the NDP government want to have happen is to have people start thinking, well, money laundering happens with the B.C. liberals who either turned a blind eye to it for whatever reason or they were in on it. Yeah, um, that that's what they want people to think in the back of their minds, either consciously or subconsciously when they go to the ballots. But I, I just I, I don't think that's the case. And this is one of those areas where you need some nuance. No one is suggesting that money laundering is fine or no big deal or does not happen. Um, and so any efforts to, to stamp it out are, are going to be a good thing. But mm -hmm. I don't think it's proper to suggest that BC is unique. I mean, it might be worse here than Alberta, Washington State. We don't know. But I don't think it's not worse than the Quebec. level of... No, exactly. <laughs> but I don't think it's at the level of, as has been suggested is what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. And then... You know, you come into it, okay, well, technically money laundering is taking, you know, money acquired in an illegal way and, and trying to clean it up so you don't have to pay, you know, taxes and other things. Um, that's the whole underground economy. Like, it, this stuff is everywhere. And, you know, with, you know, the guy who's having a rough time right now, um, who comes to your house and fix your plumbing, he's your neighbor down the street and you found him on the Facebook thing and you pay him cash and a case of beer, that's, yeah. you know, the underground economy and he's, you know, got to find a way to clean that money. Like, it's, it's crazy. So we need to be a little careful about, um, you know, like, it's hard. It's hard, it's hard for the reporters because they've won awards based on their reporting yeah. into this. And clearly there was stuff there. But, you know, does oh, it... Oh, yeah. No, no one's suggesting nothing Lavalin? was happening. No like, one. snc Lavalin, you know, yeah. was bribing officials in other countries and hiring them hookers and, you know, hookers and blow and the whole thing, right? Like... This is very different kind of stuff. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes. But um, I was just intrigued. Like, you would think that uh, day one they would have... I, I would assume that day one they would have had their best expert ready to go. Um, the one who would give the most broad base understanding. And if that's the case, <laughs> then... I'm not sure what they we're doing. Maybe they were treating it more as an overture than, you know, leading with their uh, with a leadoff hitter. But uh, again, yeah, early days. All right. What the heck, Dr. Weaver, v, my, my notes say here, Weaver v. Greens. Um, <laughs> so, I, I mean, it, I mean just, just the fact that you can frame it like that accurately says a lot, right? I mean, yeah. he was the Greens yeah. not too long ago. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, was, it, sort of, it happened very quickly. If you, if you don't know, uh, on Saturday night, I was going to say late Saturday night, but I think around 10 o'clock, um, I don't know if that counts as late for you. We have kids. We have um, kids. That's <laughs> Andrew Weaver responded to a tweet from uh, uh, BC uh, Green MLA and leadership candidate Sonia Firstenau, who was uh, tweeting sort of musing, engaging support for a four-day work week here in BC based on following uh, what's going on in New Zealand. And Weaver's response said, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but called it an absolutely kooky idea, uh, decision-based evidence-making, which yeah. I... I mean, I love that line. That's a really good line without comment on those involved. And, it, and but it wasn't just that. Um, it, it wasn't a direct message. He, he hashtagged it, BC Poly, to make sure it got seen. And then, you know, they, a lot of people replied to him saying uh, all sorts of things, either this is great or how dare you. And he responded to a lot of them and he went into detail. He said that he was, uh, I think the most interesting thing was that he was prepared uh, a couple of years ago to attempt to force an election 
um, or with the NDP over LNG. Um, not call an election. He can't do that. And he didn't say that. He said that he wanted to, def- uh, to engineer defeating the government over it. Um, wow. Which was never going to happen <laughs> because you no, have four- never. 42 BC Liberal MLAs who were going to support whatever gets LNG across the line because that is just as much their legacy. In fact, probably more of their legacy than uh, the NDP who happened you know, to pick up the ball on the two yard line. Um, yeah. So what he was saying is that he was they he was implying that that first to now and Adam Olson just wouldn't go along with him and, and wouldn't, you know, yeah. wouldn't vote against it. Now, they did vote against the LNG legislation, but they also voted for all the confidence motions like the right. budget and, and all that kind of thing. Well, 14 times they voted against LNG, which yeah. is a nice stat. Good job by Adam Olson pulling that out. Um, <laughs> that is actual evidence base. Um, like <laughs> Weaver. Weaver is such an interesting cat. Now, first of all, if you don't, if you only go on Twitter at one period during the day, go on after about nine o'clock because BC Poly nighttime Twitter is a whole other beast, man. Like uh, Keith Baldry kind of lets the guard down a bit. Doc Weaver lets his guard down quite a bit. Farney's been known to kind of tweet stuff mm-hmm. out then. Like nighttime Twitter is way better than daytime Twitter. Twitter. That's my hot take. And <laughs> um, uh, I thought I was going to say, look. Oh, the, the good doctor, I mean, like, it's one thing to step down as the leader of the party. It's another thing to step down as a member of that party and sit as an independent. Yeah. Um, but it's an even further thing to say, you know what, like, now he's, like, basically actively campaigning against them. Yeah. He's been um, more critical of First Snow and Olson than he has of the government in power. That's true. I, I mean, his criticisms of Olson were more sort of, you know, he, he didn't want to support him on this. The criticisms of First Now were, per, were personal. Yeah, kooky. You know, called it k- kooky and that she hadn't, you know, the tweets she said she hadn't done her homework and all that yeah. kind of thing. So, I mean, it was it was a different kind of criticism. Yeah. Uh, and this is uh, relevant because First Now is the one running for leadership. Olson isn't. Yes, exactly. And, and Olson, like the, the reading between the lines, you get the feeling Weaver thinks Olson was a little bit spineless. But... Okay, he didn't come out and say it. We're like, no. kooky is a loaded word in Greenland because, um, <laughs> frankly, they have their platform has been seeded with many, many kooky ideas over the years. Their financial plans still don't make any sense. If they actually ever got the levers of power and were in government, they would be a, a complete, like, no one knows what they would do because their policies are insane. So, um, you know, this is a, this is a, a group that talks about housing affordability but wanted to like quadruple the property transfer tax. So, you know, this is, they have plenty of kooky policies, but to see Doc Weaver like come out, I mean, I, I just assumed he'd kind of fade into the sunset. And... You know, it's it's interesting you say that because that's one of the first questions, in fact, I asked him um, when he announced that he would be, you know, stepping down as leader and then, you know, stepping away from the scene is, I, I think what I literally asked him is, how will you handle not being the center of attention? Because you have been for a long time. And he chuckled and, and said, uh, you know, I understand why you're asking that, but, um, you know, I, I'm anxious to step back. I'm anxious to not be the center of attention. I want to do other things. Um Mm. He, uh, Weaver will, will uh, Weaver will not like this comparison. I'm not comparing the two as individuals, but it is very interesting to watch him and federal former, I guess, federal leader Elizabeth May, both of whom led the Green Party to their highest heights, which are very relatively different things, um, and backing away at approximately the same time and how they're handling it. Weaver, of course, is taking a bit of a scorched earth policy, and, and Elizabeth May is kind of. Didn't she resign? <laughs> but she's still there making yeah. comments and hanging on by her fingernails. Uh, it's fascinating to watch, you know, the two most prominent green politicians in the country, uh, leaders, resign almost exactly the same time and, and handling it in such very different ways. Yeah, no, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Hey, you wrote about this uh, at the Orca, great piece, by the way. And then Thank you. you uh, talked about how politics was back, which warmed uh, the, the, the cockles of my heart, as they say in, <laughs> in Scotland. Um, but one of the things you wrote about in there as evidence that politics was back was uh, Harry Baines fumbling yeah. on the WorkSafe file. Now, I didn't mean that, uh, and just to be clear, oh, yeah. when I mean politics is back, I don't mean that Harry Baines and the WorkSafe file is evidence politics is back. I mean the reaction to it mm-hmm. and the fact that – well, I, I want to ask you sort of because I think you're, you're going to have a more interesting take on what actually happened with the WorkSafe thing. But what 
a lot of these issues that have been bubbling in the background, the opposition has been sort of happy to let bubble in the background yeah. while they were working on the pandemic. And that's what I mean by politics is back. Not that these things are suddenly happening again now, but the opposition and the BC Liberals and in some cases the media are a little more willing to say, OK, well, what about that? This is you guys made a mistake here. What's going on here? Uh, that was the most recent example. And the fact that the opposition is is kind of pouncing on it and, and uh, willing to shine some light on it, um, that to me suggests politics is back. But for what actually happened, I would, I would actually really like to hear from you. Yeah, well, WorkSafe BC has amassed a large surplus. Now, every workers' compensation board has to have a surplus because they have to have a, a certain percentage of the amount of claims that they could possibly cover. So most organizations, it's 130%. For them, they decided to be 145% out of abundance of caution. But still, above that 145%, they had $3 billion in extra premiums they've collected from employers because every employer in the province has to pay a certain amount per employee to WorkSafe BC. And then that money can be used for claims and injuries and things like that. But $3 billion. And for the last couple of years, the general sense uh, among us as an employer association, uh, for example, is that um, the NDP are desperately trying to figure out a way how to extract as much of that $3 billion as possible. So, you know, they want to you know, given their very close ties to labor unions, if they could stroke a check to every labor union member out of that $3 billion, they would. They can't because of a certain legislation and they know that they can't get it. I, I think they know they can't get through the House because even the Greens would be like, hold up. Um, so there's that kind of bubbling feeling under the surface. Other provinces have refunded it to the people who paid it, the employers, which makes sense because you essentially what's happened is employers have overpaid premiums by three billion dollars yeah. during these good times you could still refund you know even just refund half of it if you want to be very conservative and keep a cushion meanwhile the bill the billions of dollars get invested over the past few years uh despite uh, all the hatred the ndp have of donald trump uh the markets uh, have generally been very good um, i'm sure they're in canadian markets as well um so you know they performed well and, and it had grown to about that three billion i actually think it was probably more um, at, at some point based, because that was a, a year-end figure used. Anyways, all that to say, at some point Harry Baines gets sat down by WorkSafe BC and they go through scenarios during this you know, massive economic shutdown. Because remember, economic shutdown means there's no premiums to be paid into it. Investments are cratering. You know, the stock market dipped by about 30% and that's come back. Yeah. And, and about two thirds of that, but still you know, lower. And I, like every business, including ICBA, he was probably given three scenarios, best case, base case, and worst case. But for some reason in his mind, he thought worst case was what was going on, which uh, WorkSafe BC says, no, uh, absolutely not. So worst case was we've lost all $3 billion yeah. due to a huge downturn that will never recover. And yeah, and sorry, minister, we're, we're kind of out of luck, but we can, we can still hit that 145%, but you know, that's not good. Unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately for British Columbians, uh, it, it's bounced back a bit. It's probably somewhere between uh, base case and best case, I would bet. And you know, they do have, it sounds like you know, they've lost a considerable amount of money, but they still do have a couple billion dollars in surplus there that could be used, as the Liberals point out, for reimbursing employers. Maybe employers could put in um, you know, all the PPE, all the COVID changes yeah. that they've had to do to keep workers safe. Very logical idea, request, good way to you know, help those folks and, and keep workers safe, which is the whole point of the board. But bottom line, Baines uh, said one thing, WorkSafe BC said another, and now Baines has gone underground. And uh, I think we're all actively waiting for him to uh, actually resurface and answer why he uh, defaulted to the worst case scenario. Well, that, I, I, just from my read of it so far, it sounds as though this would actually be a fairly simple thing for him to diffuse. You'd think he would just call, the reporter was Rob Shaw. You'd think he would just call Rob back and be like, you know what, Rob, I, I gave you the, the worst case scenario and uh, and that's what I focused on. It was my mistake and here's the actual. I, I think it actually kind of would have fizzled out a little bit. But the, the disconnect is kind of what's the story. It's You obviously made a mistake. You took the worst case scenario. You said that's what's happening. Yeah. And then it's but, exacerbated but, by the the yeah. mis distrust that the business community has for Harry Baines. Exactly. But look, you know, we've heard of meetings where Harry Baines has, you know, essentially said there's no such thing as a good employer in British Columbia. Like you're all bad, you know, because you employ people, you're you're just reflexively bad. And listen, you know, 
Dr. Bonnie is a saint and a hero and, and all those things. It was the business community that shut down businesses even before Dr. Bonnie started issuing. It was, you know, Apple, uh, the Apple store in the mall shutting down and saying, we're going to send our folks home. That precipitated and really gave space for Dr. Bonnie to, uh, to make those harder calls to shut down big swaths of the economy. There's only been one case, one claim on a, from a construction site, which is, you know, construction has gone on completely. One claim where they, you know, it was kind of like 50-50, but they said, okay, it, it is plausible. You may have gotten this on a work site. There's no evidence to really firm that up, but, you know, they're paying a claim out of abundance of caution. That's fine. But, like, industry work continued. And so this yeah. is the problem. Like, there's that mistrust. There's that sense that Baines is just wanting to plunder this thing for NDP political uses. And, you know, where, you know, where is that money gone? Um, you know, it's fishy. The investment numbers don't add up, didn't add up when Rob reported them. I mean, how could it, uh, you know, what were you invested in that would have dropped, you know, $3 billion? <laughs> um, the and NHL. So, <laughs> yeah, so that feeling was that, you know, maybe he had, like, put it away for other causes. So that is the problem. That's why you have to have, you know, sunshine on this. And that's why Harry Baines should, you know, pick up the phone and answer reporters' calls. No, I agree. And I mean, all the politics aside, it, it's a real shame because, you know, you mentioned businesses and uh, who have been taken, obviously, I mean, we don't have to explain this, have been a big revenue hit and also now need to invest in things like PPE. Mm -hmm. I dropped off dry cleaning for the first time in almost three months yesterday. There's a little mom and pop place a block or two from here. Um, and they have big plexiglass partitions and all that set up that weren't there before. Is that a huge cost? No, but they had to come up with it. And that's on a very small scale. Think about, you know, uh, my son is going to the dentist later this afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. And I, I know because my wife went yesterday that they have everything cordoned off and everyone who works there is basically wearing like astronaut suits. Again, not free. Um, if there was ever a time to dip into a surplus and help businesses invest in stuff that's going to keep us all safe, now's the time. Yeah, no, exactly. No, you've hit the nail on the head. Like the money was there. It should be used for this. And even if there's only, even if only 50% of it is there, that's still a billion and a half dollars that you can put towards helping uh, businesses. And lest we forget, the NDP government has done nothing for businesses during this. All they've done is defer payments. And there's a deferral cliff coming where work safe premiums mm -hmm. are due again, where deferred PST is due again, where deferred employer health tax is due again. They have not given a single dollar of actual relief to businesses. Um, you know, so they've given it to, they've given a thousand bucks to individuals, they've given $500 rent subsidies to individuals, but nothing for small businesses that are struggling through this. So don't say you're doing everything you can when you have this pot of money that could actually help defray the cost of, uh, of PPE and plexiglass and all those important things. Yeah, the snooze button is great, but you still have to put an eight hour, eight hour day in after it. Exactly. And it just means people are gonna be working longer to make up for it. Exactly. What do you wanna talk about next? Oh man, well, um, there's so much we could talk about. Uh, I am curious what you guys are doing uh, next week for schools reopening. Okay, yeah, so we're sending our kids. We have no problem. So I have a 17 and a 13 year old in high school. They'll both go one day a week. I have a uh, 10 year old, he'll be going two days a week. And part of it is um, look, like the older two, they, they kind of get to write their own ticket. They want to go back. Yeah. The younger one misses social interactions, obviously. Um, but we yeah. want them to see the changes that are going to occur that are probably gonna be in place in the fall as well. And yeah. we want them to feel comfortable with them. There's gonna be, you know, it's, it's different, it's different. We're reopening our office here at ICBA on Monday. There's anxiety that first time you venture out, the first time you went to the dry cleaner, there's anxiety, yeah. right? Like, so letting them see that, hey, it's okay, it's safe, you know, it's not a big deal, okay, like maybe a kid, some of the kids are wearing masks, that's their choice, yeah. that's all right, you know, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing, like it's all gonna be all right. You know, you can't sit here and say, we, you know, you've trusted doc, Dr. Bonnie the whole way. And then now be like, well, yeah. oh, she's, oh, she's gone over the edge <laughs> now. Like, oh, this is crazy. Um, cases are low, very low. Um, yeah. Now is the time to go back. So, so yeah, we're, we're firmly in the send them back camp. 
that's good. We uh, well, not, I mean, it's, it's good that yeah. you're feeling comfortable about it. Where our son is also going back to preschool on Monday, uh, mm-hmm. similar reasons. Um, although in his case, it's five days a week uh, wow. because it's not school. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, with very, uh, they've sent out a long list of restrictions uh, that mostly have, uh, have to do with us, and we have very strict drop-off and pickup windows now. And I mean, like down to the like eight-minute windows, yeah. which will be challenging. But they also said there's going to be a learning curve, and they're you know just do your best. Um, in our case, it's you know, he, a he misses his friends; he's an only child, and also we live in a condo. Mm-hmm. Kid needs to run and play outside. He's yeah. he's ready. It's time. And I'm yeah. actually um we're a little bittersweet about it because we've had a great time with him, but like I'm happy for him he needs to see his friends and he, he needs to run yeah yeah there's a study uh in the states say that a third of americans who have not been locked down as long as we have but a third of americans are experiencing mental health issues yeah anxiety um you know generally mild symptoms but symptoms nonetheless we've got to get out like there has to be some kind of normalcy look like yeah. we work above metro town i was here on monday um, there was a lineup of 15 people to get into the garage clothing store. Old Navy's open. Like, it's starting to yeah. come back again. People are starting to walk around again, and they're taking care of themselves and taking precautions as best they can, and um, it, it's happening. The one thing I will say, um, like, for you, like, one of the problems, one of the interesting things about this is BC is a huge province. There has not been a confirmed new case on Vancouver Island in something like 17 days. Yeah. I'm a bit of the mind, like, why wouldn't they be opening everything up for you guys, McLean? Like, why aren't the playgrounds open? Why aren't, like, 17 days without a single new case on Van- all of Vancouver Island is a remarkable statistic. And yeah. I do wonder what the point is of you guys having some of these things in place. Like, even, even in, like, all of BC, there's something like 250 active cases, and 50 of them are in the hospital, and who knows how many are in yeah. the prisons or health, long-term health care facilities. But, you know, it's getting harder and harder mathematically to come into contact with someone who actually has the virus. Yeah, and Vancouver I, I mean, Island, right. very, and, very difficult. Yeah. I mean, Dr. Bonnie Henry's basically said a few times that they're not entertaining a region-by-region approach uh, for the time being. But, you're, I mean, that what you mentioned in Vancouver Island, where we live, that absolutely played into our decision. Uh, because we were asked if we want to go back into preschool. And, you know, of course there's some trepidation. But, you know, on the whole, if you look at the numbers, it's pretty safe. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you mentioned, you know, playgrounds. Uh, that has been a sore spot for us. <laughs> that yeah. would be, I, I, I think we are kind of at the point where it could be safe, but I appreciate the reluctance and the conservatism. I understand where it's coming from, but you're right. It's the math suggests that it probably would be safe, all things considered, yeah. to open up the, uh, the find playgrounds. Me, find here. a case anywhere in the world, McLean, where a kid contracted yeah. it from a playground. There are none. Yeah. It, you know, and okay, well, teenagers may sit there. So, yeah. so that's, that's... like, you know, I, some kids are playground kids. My, our daughters were playground kids. Our son, he's more yeah. a sport kid. Like any, you know, he'll run around anywhere. But the, the little girl, the girls when they were little, very much were um, playground kids. This would have been very difficult to manage for 12 weeks. Uh, our son is definitely a playground kid and it has been. Yeah, so I, I, don't, uh, I don't envy you. Um, can we talk about NHL hub cities? Yes, I want to talk about that. What uh, did you? Were you dis? I, there was a lot of people who were, who were disappointed that it's pro- Vancouver probably will not be one of them. But I mean, if you can't go to the games, I mean, if you're by definition only watching it on TV, yeah, eh, but that's how the, I feel. But here's the thing, McLean. It's not about the fans. It's about the economic boost yeah, yeah. for a tourism economy that is floundering. Mm-hmm. So Jason Kenney's getting major. Um, well, crap today from folks because he said, look, lift the 14-day, um, you know, it's, don't make NHL players who come to Edmonton have to, you know, square away for 14 days. Yeah, let, let's, let's be reasonable here. And they're like, oh, NHL players shouldn't have different rules, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I get all that. Jason Kenny is looking at a reeling economy and a tourism sector that is going to be at maybe 10, 15% of what it normally is and saying, I can fill, you know, several hotels, for several weeks with people who are healthy, young, low risk, right? Like, hmm, maybe this isn't a bad idea. And, you know, government's running out of money. You know, the more and more, yeah. you know, you look at this budget deficit that the feds have, they're not gonna have money for a second wave bailout. Like, 
So yeah, you saw that report one. saying that if they have to lock down again, their their money they just don't have anymore. They can't. We cannot do this again financially. Exactly. So you've got to find a way to get these the economy back up and running. That includes the tourism economy, especially in Vancouver. Now, I think they're going to end up in L.A. and and probably Vegas. I know yeah. there, there's talk of having an eastern city, but it just makes sense to have Vegas and L.A. You've got the hotel infrastructure. You've got the rinks yeah. there. You can put the, the guys in Disneyland essentially and, and do it there. Yeah. So, but. You know, we should be investigating ways to try to help the tourism sector. We're still unclear. Like, we're trying to book our summer vacations, and we're like, okay, so can we go to Banff? Like, is this yeah. the year to go to Banff? You know, is the question we've asked ourselves. And we're like, well, it's across the border. Will they let us in? It's pretty clear Jason Kenny was, will be more than happy to take British Columbia's money. But, you know, yeah. at the same time, we're like, we're comparing it to Penticton. Okay, so if we go to Penticton, mm -hmm. like, are hotels open? Like, can we book a hotel? Is a hotel an open thing? Our Airbnb, is that an open thing? Like, can we... So these, like, you've got to give people options. And look, the camping website crashes. You yep. know, what, 10, 10 or 12 reservations a, a minute or a second coming? Like, it was crazy yeah. at the beginning. And it's because people are like, we want to go away somewhere. We've got to get out of this house. We've got to get out of this condo yeah. for even a few days. Give us some options. So... That to me is where we have to have a better talk about tourism and we, we need to know from Tofino, are you going to welcome tourists? We need to know from Haida Gwaii, yep. will you actually welcome tourists? Can, can we go to the fishing lodge? You know, we need to know from the Okanagan. And I, I'm not sure that those conversations have been had. No, and I, I feel like some of the places that have been most loudly saying no right now, you, you mentioned Haida Gwaii, yeah. will be among those places that kind of openly, I don't want to say plead, but, it, you know, what when things start getting really dry in the end of August and people haven't been coming and yeah. they need that money to get through not just the fall, but maybe another lockdown, they're going to be the ones most loudly saying, please come and visit. Please, yeah. please come to the fishing lodge. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, we've had the exact same conversations here. We've been talking about this summer we were going to go visit uh, family in Southern Alberta. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but also, um, you know, what are we going to do this summer? Um, can we camp? Can we go to Tofino? Can we go to Uclulet? I, mm, yeah, it's hard to say. Well, I see the Royal BC Museum is hoping to reopen next month. Um, you and yeah. I are going to go see the Orca, the Orca that, um, exhibit. Yes, but they've delayed that exhibit now till next year. Well, the nerve. Yes, that, I know. All right. Well, uh, nonetheless, but you know, I kind of think right. Like, I, I'd like to come across and see you. I'd like to come across and see uh, do some meetings. But you know, I'm like, that's not really essential. But it's you know, businessy, like it is kind of, but you know, and if I went, I, you know, Victoria's beautiful. Take the kids for a few, couple of days and stay and spend Absolutely. some money and, you know, and I'll stop by the Phillips uh, brew pub and, you know, do the important things. But there is, no, the, like, there's just such, there's just no clarity whatsoever about whether that's allowed. No. And so. it seems to be sort of changing. Um, I don't want to say day by day, but yeah, we, I mean, there's a reason we haven't booked summer vacations here. Uh, we looked at a couple of things that might work, but also the other thing is um, um, we originally thought the house would be sitting next week yeah. for a couple of weeks in June. That's not happening anymore. Um, it's, we don't have a start date yet. Uh, probably June 15th, more likely June 22nd. This is all unofficial. Yeah. Uh, and part of it is just they having trouble nailing down the logistics. And when they do sit, it's going to be for, you know, six, seven weeks. Yes, um, and it sounds like it'll be three days in person, two days estimates yeah. via Zoom. Now, here's the fun thing. So I, I was talking with someone in MLA, and uh, they said, yeah, I, I guess Plekis's office has a lot to do with the rules. Yeah. And, but really, they're in negotiation between Farnworth, Polak, and I guess, is First Snow still house leader? Yeah, she is. So the three of them. Um, at one point, they came up with this idea that, well, or Plekis came out and said, well, I don't think any MLA over the age of 60 should be in the house. Oh, okay. Well, they're the ones most prone. That's great. That would have reduced the BC Liberal Caucus to about 12 or 13. Still, that's fine. The problem was it meant John Horgan couldn't be in the house. It meant Mike Farnworth couldn't be in the house because they are both in their very early 60s. So that rule has now been changed to 65, and all of a sudden you can have, like, now there's, like, 25 Liberals who can be in the house and, and Farney and, and the Premier. Um, one can only imagine, like, th those are the kind of delicate things that are being discussed, right? Like, simple thing, like, well, people over 60 are at more risk, so we should protect them by keeping them away. Well, yeah. I'm the freaking premier of the province. I'm going to the house. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, well, like the, exactly. I'm like the cowards in Ottawa. These guys are going to work. Yep. 
And uh, I, I think that there's a, they were originally going to sit for a much shorter period of time, but I, I think given the fear that there might be a second wave in the fall, or at the very yeah. least more risk, better to have a longer sitting now while it's safe which I actually do think is wise. It sucks for those of us who would like to go away this summer. (laughs) But I do think it's a better decision. The other thing that um, I gather has been a problem is literally where do some of them stay when they come here? Not all of them have, you know, rented or purchased hotel, uh, excuse me, apartments and condos. A lot of them stay in hotels. They're not open yet. Yeah, well, that's Um, one of the reasons why I think they're talking about June 22nd because June 21st, the Hotel Grand renovations are done or something. Right, yeah. So yeah, that wasn't even related to COVID. That was just renovations because yeah. obviously they weren't expecting to need to house MLAs in June. <laughs> yeah, which I okay, that's that makes sense, I guess. I mean, when we go, we usually stay at the Marriott, but that's because yep. the ICBA president Chris Gardner loves his Bonvoy points, and <laughs> like you've never seen anyone as dedicated to a customer loyalty program as Chris Gardner is to Bonvoy points. <laughs> the man is insatiable. He forces us all to sign up immediately when we get employed here. It's like, what's your Bonvoy number? Well, what do you mean? I only go away like three nights a year. You need a Bonvoy number. So, oh my God, it's a, it's a whole thing. But um, there you go, a little, little behind the scenes. Um, speaking of Plekis, um, they're not really going to give Alan Mullen a gun, are they? Well, this is, I mean, this this was suggested in the very, very early days of all this drama. I'm using the hand waves because it's almost too much to, to talk about. But in the very early days after uh, Craig James and the Sergeant in Arms, Gary Lenz, um, were removed from the legislature, it emerged that, uh, excuse me, Plekis had floated his chief of staff, Alan Mullen, to replace Lenz. Um, this was completely and quickly shot down by the three House leaders. And they all confirmed that this happened. Um, it's not clear whether or not this was just sort of a, an, oh, by the way, just off the top of my head suggestion or a, here's what I've been thinking all along. Um, but it's uh, it was serious because, as you mentioned, the sergeant at arms, um, they are literally armed. They can carry sidearms. Um, and they're always chosen from among the legislative protective services, which, I mean, it, it, if you've never been to the legislature, they're, yes, they are generally people sort of north of 40 and 50, but all of them, without exception, are former police officers or members of the armed forces. I'm good friends with one who just recently left who's a former British paratrooper. Wow. In short, it, yeah, uh, it, with the SAS. So um, in short, these are people who, if you need help, can help you. Um, Alan Mullen, whatever his other qualities, is neither a former police officer nor a former member of the armed forces. So, I mean, at the very least, it would be jumping the queue. Um, Since then, uh, last summer, uh, Mullen and an unnamed contractor toured across a bunch of state and provincial capitals to compare security systems and measures and, uh, you know, the structures of their security systems. That report was supposed to be forthcoming last fall. It was not. Apparently, it has now been delivered to the Legislative Management Committee. Uh, It's not public yet. And there is some speculation that one of the things it might suggest is splitting off the sergeant-at-arms duties into two, Um, uh, sort of a a ceremonial position, much like they have now, but then also one who actually manages the security staff. I don't know whether that's a good idea. It might be. We haven't seen the report. But it also... If you remember that Plekis had suggested Mullen get the the one sergeant in arms role, it stands to reason if they recommend it split into two, he might again suggest somebody that he clearly has a lot of confidence in. Yes. Well, well my advice would be make sure that that person has to be uh, vetted by the legislature legislature itself, and that the speaker can't just hire willy nilly because uh, that is uh, that's not great. That's not great. Well, the, the Legislative Management Committee would have to sign off on, on literally anything. But, I mean, and, and again, I, I can't emphasize enough, this is informed speculation. It is not, I have right. not seen the report. I don't know what's in it. Uh, but Plekis did recommend Mullen for the sergeant-at-arms position before. Um, and this has been something that's been done elsewhere. So it's, we'll find out. But there is some, I, I, it's mostly connecting the dots. Yeah, this report's going to be thin as uh well thin as the uh vancouver Canuck blue line like here you go i love quinn hughes but the rest of them are bums but listen like there's just no way like you house of commons and parliaments and legislatures in other parts of the world are not going to give you really in-depth information about their security systems McLean. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Why would mm. I, if I ran the Alberta legislature building, why would I be telling people from outside the jurisdiction, oh, yeah, you know, like we've got, you know, 17,000 cameras, 655, you're just not going to do it. So, 
my sense is anything they've picked up will just be on their you know flimsy observation like oh look at there's a camera there and there's a, you know an old guy there and like I I I, I do not have uh, much uh, expectation for the uh, Mullen report. Yeah, I mean I I share that for the most part. Um, I I think that if there was going to be value, it would be in sort of like comparing administrative structure. Right. But I don't see why traveling to Regina is necessary to ascertain how the Saskatchewan legislature has set up their security apparatus. That is the kind of thing that could probably be done with Google or at the very least, you know, phone or video conferencing yeah. like this. Now, again, haven't seen the report, don't know, but that we'll is see. how it appears to me. We'll see. Um, McLean, um, last thing. I have yes. an idea on how the Liberals can kind of blunt uh, some of the COVID stuff in the next election. BC Liberals. BC Liberals. So we're headed for yeah. an election in October 2021. I, I highly doubt it'll come in the spring because the econ mm -hmm. economy numbers need to bounce back. There could be a second wave. Horgan's going the whole way to October 2021. Plus, you know, when they, they made a huge deal about yeah. adding those five or six months on to the end of that because yeah. of you know, needing to know the actual numbers of the budget. Okay. We can't, we can't have any fudge of budgets. That's great. And, you know, I think even the Liberals supported that legislation. So October 2021. Here's, I think, the, the thought in BC Liberal land is, okay, like how do we, we want to be the guys who, you know, are, we're, the, we're the, econ the, the economy guys. Like, we're the ones who build opportunity and prosperity in BC. You know, I think kind of their messaging will be like, yeah, the NDP were fine during the COVID situation, but we're the ones who can rebuild the economy and get us back, our fiscal house back in order and make the tough decisions to make sure that, you know, our kids aren't saddled with the debt from this lockdown. Um, you know, 25, 30, 40, 50 years down the road. Okay, that said, uh, the NDP are going to be like, hey, you know, lowest, uh, other than, you know, Vietnam and a few other small places, like lowest uh, deaths per capita. We mm -hmm. did a great job. Like, you know, you look at the death numbers in Ontario and Quebec, you know, 3,000 people dead and you're going, wow, we've got 150. That's yeah. pretty, pretty amazing. You know, Adrian Dix is a hero. You know, John Horgan made the tough decisions and we kept you all safe, blah, blah. That will be, I'm not sure they will be that crass, but that will be the underlying narrative. We've proven that we can get BC through a crisis. So here's what I would do if I were the BC Liberals to blunt that. I would do nothing but praise to the highest heavens, Dr. Bonnie. Dr. Bonnie did this, and Dr. Bonnie did that, and Dr. Bonnie did this, and wasn't Dr. Bonnie great when she did that? And we all remember when Dr. Bonnie saved the day, and Dr. Bonnie did it, and Dr. Bonnie kept us safe, and Dr. Bonnie protected the children, and Dr. Bonnie made sure it didn't spread too many long-term care homes. Dr. Bonnie. And yes, he prays on her, because Dr. Bonnie ain't on the ballot. And Adrian Dix can be, you know, you know, you can say, yeah, you, he's been great, but, you know, none of us really know what Dr. Bonnie ordered and what, Doc, what Adrian Dix did and what John Horgan did. Like the average person, you know, are going to default to trusting a doctor more than a politician. So uh, my sense is you make Dr. Bonnie like, like the liberals should come out and say, we need to build a statue of Dr. Bonnie. Like you cannot praise her enough. Yes. And in that way, you sort of diminish the uh, NDP like, and uh, oh yeah, those guys were kind of tagging along for the ride. What do you think? I think that's probably exactly what they're going to do. Um, because you're right, they're going to um, be happy to associate the hopefully continued well handling and success uh, in the face of COVID-19 with uh, with Dr. Bonnie Henry and not with, you know, Adrian Dix, who's going to be on a ballot, not with John Horgan. And I also, I mean, we've talked about this before, the difference between winning the war and winning the peace. And um, I like the example of World War Two, where, you know, Winston Churchill, the man who won the war and stared down the Nazis and, and uh, saved the British Empire, lost a bid for re-election in the last few months of the war because the British public, for whatever reasons, you can disagree with them or agree with them, you know, <laughs> however many I years after the I disagree with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, they judged the Labour Party and Clement Attlee to be better positioned to rebuild the economy mm -hmm. and, you know, transition away uh, millions of men in arms and find jobs for them and deal with crippling unemployment and, and, and you know, shift their entire economy away from, you know, war production back to something vaguely resembling normal. Whether they were right or not, they, that was... They didn't give Churchill a gift election even during the war. Uh, it was a decision that was made. And it was, if you look back, this election was a landslide. It wasn't close. It wasn't no. a close-fought thing. I, I think that that is what the BC Liberals, they need to look at that and decide that if they, if they are happy to give Dr. Bonnie Henry and even to some extent, you know, Adrian Dix and John Horgan credit for winning the war against COVID-19, 
they are the ones to rebuild the economy afterwards. That is the message that they should be shouting. Uh, I would tell them to shout from the rooftops next yeah. year. Yeah, and look, the, you know, the Liberals are good at that. Liberals left yeah. the NDP with billions in surplus, not just in WorkSafe BC, but in other, in the actual budget itself. Like, they do have, that is their brand, that is what people think of when, you know, when they think of the BC Liberals and the difference between them. Like, come out, you know, you need to have a couple counterintuitive policies as far as taking care of people, and no one's saying that. But you do have to have this idea that, like, we need a strong fiscal um a fiscal vision so that we can start to get ourselves out of this. And right now, the NDP are already kind of flailing around, and more so some of their constituents are flailing around with, oh, we need a Green New Deal, we need, mm -hmm. you know, pour zillions into this, and oh, infrastructure doesn't create jobs, which is, uh, you know, absolute horse hockey, of course it does. Um, you know, they're all kind of starting to grasp. Dogwood Alliance, or the NDP buddies now are talking about, well, now, there's never been a better time to lower the vote to age 16. Like, they're struggling for ideas um, because the world has changed, but their hobby horses have not. And so I think yeah. the Liberals come in and say, look, we recognize the world has changed and we recognize the number one task is to make sure, yeah, we protected our children from catching this disease and dying, and but now we gotta make sure that we protect them from a fiscal future that is you know, crippled by debt, uh, crippled by high interest payments that you know doesn't have the necessary infrastructure they need to succeed yeah, for the future. And it, just as a quick aside on something you mentioned, it is slightly amusing that some of the same people who are most outraged, aghast, and appalled at the um, the Alberta minister who said that a pandemic is a great time to build a pipeline because you, you can't have protests with mass gatherings, how dare she take advantage of it, are some of these same people saying, well, this is a great time to you know kill oil. This is a great time to lower the voting age to 16. Basically, their pet project. Yep. Yeah. Is, uh, the pandemic is a perfect time for their pet project, but any other pet project, that is crass opportunism, sir. Yes, yeah, we're exactly right. This is a great time to, uh, to have a public inquiry into hand washing, like the <laughs> dummies at the building trades are suggesting, like just completely out there stuff. Um, I, I, I'm gonna tweet, a, I tweeted out a graph, so at Jordan Maven, please follow me. I, I tweeted out a graph of the Pew Research Center, and the headline of the graph is, um, uh, COVID death rates uh, in Democratic congressional districts falling, Republican death rates stay the same. And then you look at the graph and it's like two and a half times more deaths in Democratic, <laughs> Democratic uh, constituencies than in Republican ones. Republicans kind of have this flat line at about 2%. And then, you know, they're, they're, the Democrats get as high as 7.4 and they get down to about 5.5. And, and you're like, Guys, you're missing the point of the story here. Like, if you're trying to make it a partisan thing, you're making it the wrong partisan thing. Like, you know, it's crazy. But that's what kind of happens, right? Is people get stuck, you know, they get stuck in their bubbles and everything is just, you know, what, what's, the, what's the term, evidence biased? Or what did Dr. Weaver say? Oh, uh, decision-based evidence making. Exactly, exactly. God, that's so, a great line. Yeah, so that is uh, <laughs> kind of what happens. And, and so, yes, take a look at Jordan Bateman for that, uh, for that graph. Well, I look forward to that. And that, uh, man, it's the, the hot stove. It's longer than unspun, but it goes by even faster sometimes. It's our spicy takes. <laughs> speaking, of spi Hopefully. speaking of spicy takes, the uh, lunch du jour here at ICBA is Chipotle. Ooh. Yes. Like yeah. the restaurant Chipotle? Chipotle, like uh, they're bringing it into us. Yes, it's fantastic. Oh, man. So, so our, we're, lunch... we're getting ready for our June 1st reopening here. So like... Um, every day, like there's more signage, more stickers, more places. <laughs> it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be nice to see everyone. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of new routines to learn here at the ICBA. Yeah, I can imagine. My my lunch will be whatever I make in the kitchen. Uh, I'm looking at my kitchen. Um, yeah, and there are no extra signs in my house yet. No, no, there's no. I, well, I can send you. I can uh, mail you a hand washing sign for your kid if you. No. Oh, oh yeah, there you go. Actually, you probably like that. <laughs> Well, now the funny thing is, like, every time you walk into the office, there's hand sanitizers at every location. But you kind of watch how people hand sanitize. And I sort of mm -hmm. judge the people who don't do their thumbs properly. Like, you got yes. to do the thumbs. That's crucial. The thumbs are crucial. This is what makes us different than the animals, the thumb. Yes. There you go. I mean, if you're going to skip a finger, it's, it's either this one or this one, right? Like, these are the ones you use the less. Your thumb, my God, yeah. these are the fingers. If you only exactly. wash two fingers, make it exactly. your index and your thumb. Make sure you're doing between your fingers. Uh, make sure you do your thumbs. There you go. Uh, that is Dr. Bonnie approved. That is indeed. Oh, we didn't talk about well, the other thing. She's trying to close drive-ins. 
Oh, yes. <sighs> yes. My goodness. We might. McLean, give, give, give me your 90 the, second take. There's two drive-in theaters left in British Columbia. One in Cranbrook, I believe, and one in Aldergrove, which is in Langley near us. It which been, I didn't know. I thought they were all dead. It's been running fine. They've had, you know, people, I, I know lots of families that have gone. They stay socially distant. They are, you know, every other stall is being used. But, you know, they can get like 110 cars there. And, you know, they're watching older, older movies now, like Jurassic World and things, because there are no new movies. But it's been fine. <laughs> It's been fine. Not a single case traced to it. Nothing at all. Out of the blue, Dr. Bonnie comes out and says, no, they should only be having 50 cars. And what's frustrating is, there's, she admits, there's no real science behind that. Like, she outright says, there's no, you know, it's, you know, there's no science behind this, but they should be limited to 50 cars. Well, if there's no science behind it, why? I mean, literally, you're driving in. You're in your own separate thing. And then, if you put your lawn chairs outside your car, you're outside with spacing. Like, come on. So... These are the kind of things where um, Dr. Bonnie and the, and the NDP can get into trouble when they start kind of making these sort of weird decisions and people start comparing like, wait a minute, why is that safe and that not safe? That doesn't make any sense. Why is it safe I, to have far more than 50 groups, clusters of people spaced out appropriately at Kitsilano Beach? Why is that safer than having 100 groups properly spaced out at, uh, at a drive-in? I don't know. I, I assume that the concessions were closed. And I, I've never been to a drive-in movie in my life. I actually didn't know you could bring lawn chairs in that. I just assumed you watched in your car. No, see, um, that's, see that's, you're, you're thinking of the old 50s ones where you'd make out with the girl and watch Grease or whatever. But uh, or I guess they didn't have Grease back then. But no, generally the, the wise ones will bring like, uh, you know, you bring your minivan or your car or whatever. And then you put your little seats out there. You get blankets. You watch the movie. Um, and then what you do is you uh, put the little one to sleep in the back seat of the car, and then you uh, ah. stay for the second feature. Pro tip. And then you make out with the girl watching. That's movies. right. That's right. <laughs> I missed out. There you go. See, we're a we're a public interest podcast. <laughs> Washing your hands. Tips for you know yeah. date making, night. Making your get food. everything in hot stove. Yeah. Well, it's my it's a, Jenny and I. We're celebrating our twentieth uh, wedding anniversary um, a week from today. And Congratulations. we were supposed to be in Nashville. So that's not happening. <laughs> now we're like, can we even go out to eat? Like, where? How? But we just want a night away from the children more than anything. <laughs> we love them, but it's been a lot. Yeah. No, I, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. I bet you do. All right. I do. That's it. That's enough small talk here. This is <laughs> All right. Uh, until next week, I am at McLean K. This is at Jordan Bateman. You can find us at the Orca BC and on Spotify, iTunes, uh, Google Play, everywhere. Uh, until next week, stay safe.